Blue Beetle. Sweeping down upon the underworld to smash gangland comes the mysterious, all-powerful character who is a problem to the police, but a crusader for law. In reality, Dan Garrett, a rookie patrolman, loved by everyone, but suspected by none of being the Blue Beetle. As the Blue Beetle, he hides behind a strange mask and a suit of impenetrable blue chain armor, flexible as silk, but stronger than steel. Today's episode of the Fox feature, The Blue Beetle, is the second part of a story entitled Sabotage Incorporated. In the previous episode, Wentworth B. Charles, president of Explosives Incorporated, has been stabbed to death, apparently with an ice pick, as he was phoning the police about a shipment of munitions. Investigation discloses no murder weapon and no clues to the killer. All doors and windows of the Charles apartment were securely locked and bolted from the inside. A later secret investigation by Dan Garrett as the Blue Beetle discloses that the occupants of an adjoining apartment, a Professor Daniscue and his male secretary, are part of a sabotage ring whose purpose is to destroy a trainload of explosives and war munitions as it passes over the Rocky Gorge Bridge from the United States to Canada. As the Blue Beetle confronts them, he is rendered unconscious by a suffocating gas shot from an air pistol by a young girl named Vicky, one of the conspirators. As the episode ends, the conspirators plan to dispose of the Blue Beetle by dumping his bound and unconscious body aboard the munitions train, which is to be destroyed. As our story opens today, Vicky is on her way in a private plane to Rosno, near the Canadian border, to supervise operations at the bridge. The professor and Igor are to follow as soon as they dispose of the Blue Beetle. Well, Professor, here we are at the freight yard. Yes, and if I'm not mistaken, that's the train with a load of guns and explosives aboard. Yes, it's moving. Yeah, we'll have to hurry. Give me a hand with the Blue Beetle here. Yes. All right. There you go. Oh, he's heavy. Yeah, it's his chain armor. Oh. Now, here comes an empty dump car. Yes. We throw him in. One, two, three. Ah, uh, there he is. Farewell, Blue Beetle. You may reach heaven when the train blows up. But you won't stay long. <laughs> no, hello, Doc France. Have you seen Danny? No, no, not for some time. Have you got any idea where he might be? He said something about working on this explosive. Yeah, yeah. That's what I thought, but I ain't seen him. Uh, what's that, Mike, in your hand? Uh, a present for your youngster? Oh, oh that. Uh, that's an air rifle. I, I found it in the apartment next to where Charles was killed. Oh, uh, find anything else? Uh, nothing much except this. Uh, any idea what it might be, Doc? Hmm. It's an aluminum mold of some sort. Yeah, for making knitting needles or something, but what would the professor be wanting? Uh, wait. Wait. Wait, Mike, uh, I've got it. You got what? The weapon that killed Mr. Charles. Uh, what do you mean, Doc? That aluminum mold was filled with water and placed in an electric refrigerator. The water froze into little sharp pointed icicles about the size of an ice pick blade. Yeah, I can see that. Then, then they were shot from that air rifle at the victim. Even though the air rifle looked innocent enough, it is a particular type with sufficient air propulsion to make those needle pointed icicles penetrate deep into the victim's body where they melted, leaving no trace. But uh, how could the murderer get to him? The door and windows was locked and bolted from the inside. Mm -hmm. The murderers probably bored a small hole through the wall and shot him from their apartment. That's it. That's what happened. Well, Doc, I got to get down to headquarters now and report. I must be 
on a train. I okay, wonder if there. it's... Bring your children on this train. Scram. Where are you headed for? Canada. But you ain't going. Is this train loaded with munitions? What's that to you? I'm the Blue Beetle. Yeah, I'm Napoleon, and this is your Waterloo. You're getting off or else... Oh, wait, wait. Help me out of here. I want to sure, warn you. Sure, sure, I'll help you out. Out of the bottom like a load of coal. We don't carry passengers, mister. And don't say I didn't warn you. beneath those cars. Now to get to a phone somewhere and warn the authorities to flag that train. Hey, who's down there? The Blue Beetle. Have you got a phone? The, the Blue what? And we ain't got a phone. Where's the nearest telephone? Five miles down the road. Jed Hawkins' place. Thanks. But he ain't home. Where can I get a car? Uh, the trolleys don't run out this far. They get a bus in the morning. Afraid I can't wait. Uh, how far is the border? About uh, 20 miles. I've got to get there in a hurry. Who are you running away from? Not running away. I'm trying to prevent a crime. Well, uh, I could drive you out to Rosno in the morning. Where's the nearest airport? Rosno. Ten miles. Uh, drive me to the airport tonight, and you'll be a hero in the morning. So will you be if you live through my driving. Uh, I'll be down soon as I get my boots on and uh, <laughs> my store teeth in. <laughs> Faster, pilot, faster. I've got to flag that train down there before she reaches the bridge. There uh, she's too close. Can't make it. Can't bring that train to a stop in less than a mile. The track's too wet. Give me that red lantern. What are you going to do? Bail out with my parachute and wave this red lantern as I go down. Well, here I go. Almost to the bridge, Sam. Yeah, five more miles and our job will be done. And glad I'll be. In 30 years of railroading, this is the toughest job I've ever had. Hauling 50 cars of explosives and war equipment to Canada ain't my idea of a soft snap. Yeah, no telling when you may run into an open switch or a pile of ties on the track. There's plenty of foreign spies would like to wreck a train load like this. Hey... Listen to that plane. Yeah. Must be something important to bring that guy out on a stormy night like this. Hey, there's no lights in the switch house. You better slow down. Green signal's up. Yeah, but you never can tell. Well, keep an eye out on your side as we reach the switch to the Rosno's fur track. Okay. Hey, look there. Where? Up there in the sky, ahead. Hey, it's the cruising lights in the airplane. Yeah, but look underneath it. Well, I'll be. There's a red light falling and swinging from side to side. Hey, maybe he's signaling us to stop. Look, there's a guy in a parachute that's dropped out of the plane. And he's waving a red lantern. That's strange. Well, there's the bridge right ahead. Maybe something's wrong with the bridge. All my signal lights have been green. Except the red lantern on the plane. Well, here goes the brakes. I hope I can bring this train to a stop on these slippery rails. That guy with a lantern has landed. He's running toward us here. Say, somebody's shooting at him. Wait a Look, there's several men around him, and he's pulling them over with his fist. Yeah. Oh, boy, what a fighter. Yeah, that must be the train guard shooting. Come on, let, let's get in on it. Right. Get back on that train and drive on to that bridge or I'll drill you. Oh, yeah? Who's going to make me? Okay, Sam. I got his gun. Well, there go the guards. That's the one of those, bud. Good work, boys. Good work. And who are you? The Blue Beetle. The Blue Beetle? What? Well, you were the man with the red lantern. Yes. I warned the authorities at Rosno, but the telephone lines out to the bridgehead had evidently been cut. 
I took the only way I could to stop you. Well, Marty, you certainly made a good job of it. What about these plotters? I caught the ringleaders back in Rosno and turned them over to the police. What about the men who shot at you? I imagine your train guards will get them, but the ringleaders are in jail. Uncle Sam will take care of them. Well, so long, Blue Beetle, and thanks a million. Okay. Give my regards to your neighbors across the border. Tell them we Americans are glad we both speak the same language in more ways than one. And so the Blue Beetle prevented a frightful tragedy and through sheer nerve, outwitted a clever band of foreign saboteurs and murderers. The moral of this story is that there never will be the perfect crime. Crimes like the murder of Mr. Charles, no matter how strangely and cleverly done, will always be found out and the guilty punished. Further adventures of the Blue Beetle will be presented in the next episode of the Blue Beetle. <laughs> copyrighted Fox feature, appearing in Mystery Men Comics Magazine and the Blue Beetle Magazine. The Blue Beetle is on the air twice a week on this same station. Consult the broadcast schedule in your local newspapers. And don't forget to listen in to The Blue Beetle.